Hello and welcome to today's episode. Uh, I'm here with Kenny Pierce, who was um, a lecturer in philosophy at Trinity College Dublin, um, but now you're over in the US and I've forgotten where you're, you're the head of a philosophy department now or philosophy uh, and religion? Philosophy and religion at James Madison University in Virginia. Right. And you, so you've just recently um, written a book with Graham Oppie, which is a part of, I think, a new series that uh, Rootledge are doing. It was, I, I'm right. Um, and I think that they're, they're hoping to kind of broach, you know, a bunch of these big issues like God's existence, free will, and kind of have, you know, leading people on each side of the debate kind of exchange views. And you've just done that with uh, with Graham Oppie. So my first question for you was, how did uh, this book kind of come about into, into your life? Right. So the uh, the kind of founding editor of this series was uh, Tyrant Goldschmidt. So he was the one who who pitched the idea to Routledge for little debates about big questions. Uh, and he was someone that I had worked with before and, uh, you know, knew some of my work and also knew some of Graham's work. I had interacted with Graham kind of slightly in the professional philosophy literature. Uh, I didn't know him personally at that time. Uh, and so it was uh, Tyron Goldschmidt who recruited both of us to this, uh, to this project and kind of set the, the parameters of the debate and did um, the initial phase of editing work. Uh, Dustin Crummett came on as editor later on in the, the process and was also very helpful in bringing the book to fruition. So I was wondering what your sort of initial thoughts were then. Um, I, I, you know, said on arguing about gods with Oppie, that's the title of sort of his book where he, yeah. he or, or where he sort of purports at least to kind of systematically go through, you know, like almost all the arguments from natural theology and offer various kind of rebuttals. Um, so what, what, what were your kind of initial views coming into, you know, this debate? Well, you know, I thought it would be very helpful um, to, to have this exchange with Graham, uh, partly because I had already uh, responded to him in the literature and my Responses to him are not entirely negative. I think he makes some very good points against some of the more popular versions of these arguments that the arguments often need to be modified. We often need to go a different direction in order to, uh, you know, be able to respond to the objections that he's raising. And so in that sense, I feel that um, he's someone I've learned a lot from about, uh, about philosophy. Um, and someone who kind of was already around and, and well known and making these arguments when I first studied, started studying philosophy. So, uh, so in a way, it was a bit uh, intimidating, right? But it's also an, an exciting place to be. And I uh, kind of knew from the beginning that this was likely to be a very productive discussion uh, because, because Graham is an excellent philosopher. So I was wondering, I mean, Oppie has, and he just says this himself in the book, you know, like heterodox views when it comes to, you know, um, the nature and purpose of arguments. Um, I, I mean, I've sort of found them quite helpful in my own thinking about some of these things. But I mean, did, were you kind of, were Oppie's views kind of new to you? Were you on board with some of his thoughts about arguments and what they actually do and their role in philosophical disagreement? Yeah, so I think I think uh, his views on that have become a little more radical over time. So I think if you look at the the arguing about God's book, which uh, I believe is nearly fifteen years old now, that uh, you know there he's saying, oh, people try to convince each other with arguments, but at least in philosophy of religion, kind of nobody's come up with any arguments that are actually going to do that. Um, more recently. I think some of the things he said are opposing the popular view that philosophy is in large part about arguments and that making arguments is what we should be doing. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of not sure what philosophy is without all the arguments, you know. Uh, and I think arguments do change people's minds. The, the thing that, that Graham and I agree on is that you pretty much always have other options for what to do besides accepting the conclusion of the argument. And the question is, once we recognize that, and once we recognize that on a question like the existence of God, people are very likely to take those other options, especially the sorts of people who are in a debate like this, uh, then what do we think the arguments are doing? And, and from there, I think Graham and I go very different directions because I think that um, 
the arguments are, are quite central to proper philosophical methodology, including the methodology of worldview comparison that, that Graham advocates, um, whereas he thinks that worldview comparison is kind of something we do instead of arguments. Okay, so would you say that that's sort of the main disagreement? Because I would, I would think that some of Oppie's sort of observations about well, which arguments you accept is uh, is going to be almost entirely determined by basically your your commitments prior to you know assessing those arguments or things like that would be relatively uncontroversial, um, or do you sort of disagree more broadly rather than just in the methodology? Yeah. So well, so I'd say. Um... I went into this debate thinking that I agreed with Grimmel methodology. So this is something I learned from the debate is that we, we don't agree on methodology as much as I thought we did. I thought that I got my approach to a worldview comparison from, well, I did get it from reading Graham's writing. Right? Um, but, but the thing I, but the thing I got is, is not the, the methodology that, that he holds now. And so I had to kind of go back and look, at some of what he'd written previously and see that kind of not everything that I, that I got is what he intended, right? Uh, which is a thing that I think happens quite commonly. Um, so, yeah, so I would say there's, there are methodological disagreements even within the broad approach you might call worldview comparison. And then obviously there are substantive agreements uh, inside the, you know, substantive agreements in the worldviews of course. Um, in terms of the, the methodology, I think what we arrived at is that we have different understandings of what a worldview is and what kind of comparison we should be doing. Because I think that it's always about the uh, total worldviews that real people actually hold and trying to figure out, what, which are partly implicit, right? It's not just everything they can tell us about what they believe, but also what they assume or take for granted or what's implied by what they believe. But it's these kind of total worldviews actually held by people. And we're trying to figure out whether they should be revised. And it's not normal and maybe it's not even possible to kind of totally reject a worldview and just replace it with a completely different one. It's more like revision is the thing that actually happens. Graham tends to think much more in terms of idealized worldviews, like what would the ideal theistic worldview be and what would the ideal naturalistic worldview be? And that's why he thinks, um, well, we can just kind of dismiss the worldviews that aren't internally consistent because clearly those aren't ideal and clearly it's possible to develop consistent versions of both. And so insofar as an argument is saying, hey, you're committed to these premises, they imply a conclusion that you don't accept, you've got a problem. Um, Graham's saying, well, then we haven't, we, we're not actually talking about one of these ideal worldviews if that's happening. Um, and so I think that is probably the most fundamental methodological disagreement is this difference about in whether we're talking about ideal worldviews or the real views that are held by real people. Yeah, because I, I think that um, Graham would say, you know, that obviously reductios comprise like good arguments in the sense that if you can, you know, if you, if you can figure out that someone's committed to some kind of inconsistency, then that's going to be a successful argument. But then that's just going to compel them to believe revision and you don't know, you know, what way they're going to go necessarily. Um, but are, are you saying then that you think that these arguments, they, they play more of a role than Graham kind of gives them credit because more of us are more inconsistent than maybe we're willing to let on or something like that. So. Yeah, something like that. But in addition, um, so I recognize a, a category of what I call tensions in worldviews, which are not full on contradictions. And I think he doesn't recognize this category at all. So I think there are also cases where kind of you're pulled both directions right but not full on inconsistency so for instance um theists and in particular the followers of the Abrahamic religions are there's certain elements of that traditional view about god that might push you in the direction of denying the reality of evil in the world but there are also both empirical considerations and kind of religious theological type commitments. 
that kind of push you in the direction of taking the reality of evil very seriously. Uh, and neither of those, I would say, is an outright contradiction. That is, you can achieve logical consistency in either direction if you're kind of willing to make the right adjustments here and there. But there's something uncomfortable about it, right? And, uh, and, and that's the sort of thing that I mean by attention. And so I also think there are non-deductive arguments, different kinds of inductive and probabilistic arguments that instead of pointing to contradictions, point to tensions. And, and we're trying to you know, produce worldviews that to make our own worldview kind of feel internally harmonious. Uh, rather, and you know, logical consistency is a low bar. It's a bar we don't always clear, but it's a low bar. And um, this, this kind of harmony or coherence is, is a, a kind of higher aim that we should have in terms of making the worldview fit together. Awesome. I, th I think uh, it will be interesting to see, I, like I know Graham has some thoughts on this because I've seen him in interviews elsewhere sort of talk about extending, you know, the, his views um, in sort of propositional logic to um, like probabilistic arguments and things as well. But I think he's working on something to do with arguments at the minute. So it'll be interesting to see if he gives that more of a treatment yeah. there. Um, okay, so with that out, out of the way then, in terms of your particular um, worldview that you're arguing for, um, you talk about how you're a classical theist. Do you want to just uh, sort of explain to people what classical theism is and maybe how that differs from other kinds of theism they might be familiar with? Sure. So so this is one of kind of many cases, a very typical thing in philosophy where there's a, a word that is maybe a bit vague or fuzzy or flexible, and every philosopher has their own more precise definition, right? So when I'm talking about classical theism, what I mean is a particular tradition and methodological approach that is trying to use, um, that's trying to use ideas from classical Greek philosophy, ideas from kind of secular pagan philosophical traditions as a way of um, making sense of the religious commitments of uh, Abrahamic theism. Um, and so these are ways of kind of putting together what I call traditional theism, the sorts of beliefs about God that would be held by ordinary believers in uh, the Abrahamic traditions, together with these this sort of philosophical approach coming out of the Greek tradition in, or, in a mutually uh, complementary way, right? It's, it's trying to Put them together. And so what do we contrast with our forms of theism that are more philosophy skeptical, right? That would be, be one contrast class. Um, it would contrast with open theism, say, that would um, deny divine foreknowledge uh, or with heavily personalist or anthropomorphic forms of theism that you know, are sometimes built on some of these narratives that are found in religious texts that portray God in a very human-like way. Classical theists are gonna tend to read that stuff a bit more figuratively in order to align with um, some of the more philosophical statements about God, which can also be given supports in the, in the, from those uh, scriptures and traditions, right? The, the question is about kind of which bits you, uh, you take, read straight and, and which bits you read kind of figuratively. And the classical theist is going to allow these sorts of philosophical considerations to help make that decision. Um, so, so that's what classical theism kind of is in general. I have a more specific thesis that I kind of describe as my version of classical theism, um, which is that uh, space time and all of its contents exist because of the free and rational choice of a necessary being. So w would you sort of um, say that under your classical theism, there's like a bit more sort of conceptual content there? So maybe, you know, like doctrines about simplicity or aseity and things like that. And, and if so, could you just sort of briefly touch on what some of those things are? Yeah. So um, so I'm not into kind of the I, I, I just can't quite find my way to what I call the, the full strength classical doctrine of uh, divine simplicity uh, that you'd find in somebody like Avicenna or Thomas Aquinas. Um, that is, I, I just can't quite get my head around it. So, you know, so they think this idea that God is one is an ultimate unity 
has no complexity and no parts. He even goes so far as saying that we can't distinguish um, God from God's attributes and we can't distinguish God from God's activities uh, and so on that ultimately, you know, God is God's wisdom and God is God's mercy. So mercy and justice are, are just the same and in God, even though they're different in us. And even God's activity of creation is just somehow the same thing as God. I, I can't quite find my way there, right? Um, it's a very difficult doctrine to make sense of. It has its attractions. But I do, you know, when I think of God as the creator of space-time, uh, that means I'm thinking that, one, God isn't the same kind of cause as the causes within the universe. I don't like to call it causation at all. I call it grounding. So, and that, so that's a point that I'm going to certainly be in agreement with Thomas on, that God is not a cause among causes. It's kind of a, a neo-Thomist slogan. Um, and I'm certainly going to say that God is atemporal. Um, and this is going to mean that we kind of can't think of God as being literally or univocally a person like us, right? And because God doesn't have, say, God's mental life doesn't unfold within time. Um, and so it is going to have these kinds of, uh, of strong statements about things like uh, atemporality and uh, impassivity as well. The idea that God, because God isn't in space and time, God can't be acted upon causally. Yeah. So j just in terms of, um, because presumably on your view, um, God doesn't kind of have parts though, or, it, you know, like there aren't these kind of distinct um, aspects of God. Like, you, you know, you might distinguish maybe someone's will from a different part of their mind. Or I, I don't know, but presumably in God, there kind of aren't these parts on your view. But so how do you make sense of that without divine simplicity? Is it just a weakened sort of form? Yeah, so I'm going to have a weakened form of divine simplicity. So, so like the weakest form of divine simplicity that virtually all theists would endorse just says God isn't made out of physical parts. Right. Arms and legs. Like pretty much all theists, even very personalist theists or open theists, are going to accept that. Um, I'm going to accept a stronger simplicity thesis than that. So I tend to think that the kind of the property of divinity is a highly unified property that we can think of God as having, and we can think of uh, omnipotence and omniscience and so forth, maybe as, as aspects or elements of that property. I'm going to think of God as kind of infinite and without limits, um, having no parts, existing outside time, and hence not having kind of temporal parts, not being temporally extended. Um, I think we, but I think though that if, we believe, if we're realists about properties, then we might need the property of divinity to be distinct from God, the being who possesses it. If we're nominalists, then maybe we get a stronger form of simplicity that way. Um, and I think God's creative activity needs to be distinguished from God. Um, and this is just a matter of like, this: what's the strongest version of simplicity that I can understand? Um, okay, and so yeah. maybe some of these Thomists and people would say, well, of course you can't understand it because you're not God. Uh, and maybe they're right, but but that's kind of um, I, I I have difficulty believing things that I don't understand, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, so there are there are more questions that I'd love to ask about you know a lot of the things that you've said, but I you know in the in the name of time, I'm gonna kind of just plot on with questions. So in terms of the view that you're engaging with, then you know Oppie's view of naturalism, could you kind of briefly expound that as you see it and as you're engaging with it in the book? Yeah, so uh, so Graham's given different definitions of naturalism in, in kind of different places. Um, one of the key theses that he often uh, uses, which is a helpful one, is um, there are none but uh, none but natural uh, entities with none but natural uh, none but natural causal entities with none but natural causal powers. So everything that kind of engages in causal interaction is natural which kind of means that it's the sort of thing that's studied by science. Now, an interesting point is that that thesis is not enough by itself to rule out my view because I see God's creation as a grounding relation, not a causal one. And Graham himself accepts uh, non-causal, non-natural entities because, um, well, non-natural, non, um, 
causal non-natural truths, at least, because he believes that the truths of mathematics and aesthetics and so on are, uh, are kind of objective truths that are out there independent of human thought, uh, and yet they're not part of the world started by science, but they don't causally interact with it. And so in order to kind of rule out my kind of theism and so forth, uh, Graham needs further theses, and one of the ones he often uses is the claim that uh, minded entities are late and local. Now, by minded, Graham prefers the term minded entities rather than minds, because he doesn't think that the mind is a, a thing apart from the body, rather uh, things like you and I, which it takes to be physical beings, have mental attributes or engage in mental actions. So we are minded entities, entities that are that have mental attributes. Um, and they're late and local, which is to say that they are produced by an evolutionary process. They show up late in the history of the universe after 13 billion years or whatever. There are no minds before that. And then they show up in a you know, few pockets here and there. He's, as far as I know, he's not committed to the claim that minded entities are only on Earth. But, uh, but, they're, but they're not pervasive. So it's going to rule out panpsychism and stuff. And this rules out uh, theism because theism kind of places a mind um, at the root of reality, right? We want to talk about God, the ultimate explanation for everything uh, with mental terms like knowledge and will. So there are a series of sort of considerations that you give both against kind of Graham's view and in favor of your view. So I think um, just this is for the audience because I've given you the outline. J just so the audience know, I'm going to go through like a series of those and then we'll go through some of the kind of objections that Graham raises um, afterwards in a kind of different chunk of questions. Mm -hmm. So the first of these, um, I, I don't think that these are in the same order as they are in the book as well. So sorry if anyone's trying to kind of like link those up. But um, the first of these that I've put is explaining history. So um, you raise a kind of contingency argument, um, right? And this is, I think, where you talk about some of the differences maybe in terms of your, your grounding explanation as well. So could you, could you explain what this, um, it, what this kind of inference is and what, why you see Graham's view as not being able to explain it? Um, I, I think you say at all, but as well as yours, at least. Uh, yeah. Sure. So, so cosmological arguments in general, this kind of family of arguments for theism or for an ultimate explainer or first cause, this family of arguments, they always start with some um, big, sufficiently comprehensive entity, some, some writers say, right? So there's some big, large-scale thing that needs explanation. And in, in my version, which is based heavily on alignments, um, I call that thing history with a capital H or the causal history of the universe. And what I mean by this is the kind of total sequence of causes and effects or all the instances of causation uh, that occur in the universe, right? So uh, all the instances of causation in reality, A causes B, B causes C, and so on. And the claim is, uh, well, how are you going to explain that, right? The, the totality of the cause-effect relations. Uh, now I say that can't be a causal effect, a, a causal explanation, right? Because if something caused history, then that thing would itself be part of history and sort of be literally causing itself in a way that is incoherent. Um, but it also can't be a necessitating explanation because the causal history of the universe could have been different. Uh, and so we need some kind of non-necessitating explanation for the total causal history of the universe. And the uh, naturalist like Oppie is not in a position to, uh, to give that kind of explanation. Um, now, now, as Graham points out in his reply, uh, he does give uh, an explanation of, of what I call history. Um, it's, it's just not a very good one. And it's not one that is consistent with his naturalism, or, or so I maintain. Um, yeah. So c could you talk about the kind of, um, I mean, we'll, we'll come, come on to some of those sort of objections in the back and forth, but in terms of your own view um, and how that explains it, could you just kind of fill in the details there? So, you know, like what what what's the nature of the kind of like grounding explanation that you purport to give? Um, and then I, ha you know, like I have some kind of questions about that, I don't know if it would be better for me to give them at the uh, after you say though you can 
Sure. Yeah. 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 So, so grounding is uh, kind of a hot topic in metaphysics. It's not a specifically theistic thing. There's a lot of discussion about it, but people use the term. Philosophers use the term in a lot of different ways. Again, this is, is fairly common in philosophy that you have to look at some particular philosopher's account of, of what they're meaning by a, a term or concept. When I talk about grounding, I mean the relation or family of relations whereby uh, more fundamental things give rise to less fundamental things. So I'm thinking about like how you get my desk from quantum fields or quarks or whatever, right? That would be a, a grounding relation. Um, the, the desk isn't one of the fundamental things. It somehow depends on the fundamental things. The, the nature of that dependence or that grounding relation is actually quite complex um, and, uh, and not crucially a matter of simple translation. So it's, it's not just a matter of this desk talk being some kind of shorthand for something complicated going on with quantum fields. There's something more than that, uh, something more than that going on. And if you look in the philosophy of science literature, there's a lot of stuff trying to work out the details of, uh, for instance, how you get from um, statistical mechanics to the behavior of gases. Um, or um, there's a, a kind of classic paper about how you get from uh, biochemistry of DNA to genes, which are, um, and so it, it turns out you can't actually make sense of it, taking it to be straightforward identity. There's some kind of more complicated thing going on with um, the kind of less fundamental things depending on the more fundamental things. So that's what I mean by grounding. Uh, and that, I think, is the kind of explanation that we need if there is to be an explanation of history as a whole. We need some kind of more fundamental uh, reality that, that grounds it. Now, history is an event. And so it's going to be more plausible if we've got a kind of event-like ground for it. And so you might think that um, in a particular context, you're raising your hand or you're marking a checkbox might constitute your voting. And so we've got this more fundamental thing, the bodily emotions, uh, and a less fundamental thing, the, uh, the voting or something like this, right? Um, and so we're gonna need something like that. And so the idea is that this divine creative activity or divine willing can serve as, as the ground that as it were constitutes history. Uh, and that's going to be the kind of explanation that I favor uh, and not a causal explanation. So this is, is perhaps one of the most distinctive or unusual um, aspects of my view. I actually think this is uh, pretty well in line with what the, these kind of medieval classical theists are saying, but it's a, a non-standard way of translating their ideas into contemporary metaphysics. So I think one one of the things as people kind of come across or, or try to wrap their head around this idea of grounding is that, you know, some of the examples that you've given, like uh, ontological kind of composition of things, you know, um, maybe that's kind of relatively intuitive. Like you can just sort of see it, you know, that um, a thing is dependent on its constituent parts or something, a whole. A whole. Um, or maybe with the like uh, voting example, right? Someone can see, yeah, like that thing sort of is dependent on the other mm -hmm. thing in a kind of way. But I think it may be in the case of history and then explaining that by God, God seems like a sort of different class of entity, you know, than maybe it's like, well, you know, in the, in the case of bodily motions or in the case of, you know, like, I don't know, a, a hole in a block of Swiss cheese, like I can see all the things in front of me, whereas God is a sort of different type of entity um, than that. And so there might be kind of issues for people to, understand, you know, uh, is this kind of like um, an explanation by postulation or is it something different? Can you, help um, me and maybe other people in the audience who are, are struggling with that to kind of get their head around what's going on. Yeah, well, I mean, if you know, a lot of the scientific examples I'm talking about are with things that are not directly observable, right? So uh, kind of all of our direct observations are of macro objects. Um, even what scientists often call uh, direct observations, very often it's a matter of like reading some data out of a hard drive that got put there by some very complicated machine 
Um, and, and so what we're very often talking is something, I mean, if you're, you're thinking about quarks or quantum fields or something, you're, you're talking about things that kind of don't fit our ordinary concepts at all and aren't very much like the tables and chairs and rocks and caps that we observe in ordinary life. But we have excellent reason to believe in them in order to explain those ordinary things and some peculiar behaviors of them because they make kind of a simple, unified, coherent explanation of the world as a whole. Uh, and so that's the same thing we're, we're after here. And of course, the, a lot of the question is going to depend on uh, how well the theory really works at the end of the day. And that's when we're going to come into this kind of worldview comparison thing. Uh, but what I try to argue in the book is that the, the theist has an explanation that's it's, um, coherent, it's intelligible, it's explanatory, um, and there just is no hope at all of producing a naturalistic explanation of, uh, of history. So that's, uh, so, so if people have, people are welcome to propose other explanations, but they won't be naturalistic ones, right? And, and so that's kind of the argument that I'm making. And so for someone who's sort of not already a theist and evaluating the premises, it would that the entity of God here would be a kind of like explanation by retrodiction or by postulation or something like that. Is that correct? Or yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. That's true. Um, okay. So I, uh, another kind of point you raise kind of against Oppie's view is you talk about there being like quite a lot of kind of bruteness in Oppie's view, which makes it less parsimonious than yours. So could you right. kind of, explain what this objection is to, to Oppie's naturalism and how um, your view kind of doesn't suffer in the same way from the same sure. So we both think that all contingent facts have explanations. Um, sort of. Uh, Graham doesn't think, Graham thinks there are contrastive facts and I don't. So this is like the, the fact that I accepted this podcast invitation rather than declining Right, so the, the rather than is what make, what's making it contract, uh, contrastive. Um, and uh, so Graham thinks there are these contrastive facts and he thinks that not all contrastive facts have full explanations. And um, sorry, I, is, is your view on that, that that's kind of a feature of our sort of limited understanding or access to the world or something like that, that, that uh, we kind of desire a contrastive explanation or something? Yeah, so my, my view is that there, so, so when I'm talking about explanation, I'm talking about uh, you know the objective relations that that ground explanation. So like causation is an example of where there's a causal relation, and citing the cause explains something, right? So I'm not talking about human explanatory practices. I'm talking about objective relations in the world, um, and I don't think there are contrastive facts to be explained in that objective sense. Um, even though sometimes we get into a certain sort of puzzlement where we want uh, we want that kind of explanation. So, uh, yeah, so that's kind of a, a detail, uh, a kind of technical detail that we disagree on. But in general, if you don't do the contrastive rather than thing, then we're going to both agree that all uh, contingent non-contrastive facts have explanations. Where we disagree is that... Um, Graham thinks that any necessary truth can be explained by pointing out that it's necessary. And um, the fact that something is necessary or possible or contingent or impossible, those modalized facts, as philosophers call them, can never have explanation, none of them. Um, now that, and on, on that, I'm, I'm going to disagree. It's part of the practice of mathematics to distinguish between um, ex proofs that explain the theorems and proofs that don't. Um, and it's uh, kind of something that we need in any kind of our philosophical theorizing in trying to understand how our account of the necessary truths fit together. And so there are these explanatory relations among necessary truths we shouldn't take them all to be brute. We should derive some from others. Um, but Graham, in effect, takes, and actually he, he's happy to, to phrase it this way, the, the doctrine of brutal necessity, um, that, uh, that all, uh, all necessary truths are, are brute. 
Uh, and given the agreed upon criteria of worldview comparison, this is infinitely costly for him because he agrees that, um, you know, so we both agree on infinitely many math facts. He takes them all to be brute and I take them to be explained. And so according to kind of his own criteria of the agreed upon data, whoever can explain more of it uh, is coming out ahead. So, um, oh, what was I actually forgot what I was going to say because I focused on something else in the chat. Um, I was going to say something about. Um, I was I was going to reiterate back what the worry was in a way that I thought I'd kind of latched onto it, but I've lost that, so I'm going to move on. Um, so, just contrasting that then to your view, there's a kind of objection, I suppose, in this vicinity that um, you know, for the theistic model to explain some of these things, maybe like the mathematical. Um, truths, right, that um, you might say that they're necessary um, in the same way, and then it's going to, you, you're kind of going to face maybe the same worry that Oppie's theory faces, or if you're going to say that they're not necessary, but they're a kind of result of God's choice or action, well, then you're going to have bruteness, but even worse, it's brute contingency, because, you know, it's it, it's kind of dependent on God's libertarian free choice to make, you know, this mathematical theorem true rather than some other one supposing it could have been that way, which I, you know, I'm not saying that's your view, but I think Oppie raises that question towards the end. So do you want to just respond to that? Yeah. So, um, right. So I think that you can explain necessary truths, um, but obviously you, uh, you know, unless you are going to believe in some kind of infinite regresses of explanation, you're going to have to bottom out somewhere in some things that, uh, that aren't explained. So I draw a distinction that, uh, that Graham doesn't, which I get from Shemik Gupta, uh, which is the distinction between brute facts and autonomous facts. So autonomous facts are facts that need no explanation, facts where asking why they're true is some kind of confusion. Um, and the, as Desgupta says, the most plausible uh, candidates for autonomous facts are uh, definitions. And we can distinguish between real definitions and nominal definitions. So this is a traditional distinction going back to Aristotle. Nominal definitions are definitions of words. Real definitions are definitions of things. So nominal definitions are, are maybe a simpler and less suspicious case. If someone is uh, wondering why all mothers are parents, they have some kind of confusion about the English word mother, right? If, if they knew what the word means, they wouldn't be wondering why all mothers are parents. Um, but there are also definitions of things uh, rather than of words. Now, some philosophers have rejected this notion of real definition, but I actually think you, you just need it for, for both common sense and science. So the example that I like to use is that physicists know what the word dark matter means, but as of this recording, no one knows what dark matter is, right? Uh, and so that's a question about a real definition. What, what actually is that stuff, right? And so real definitions, just like nominal definitions, are good candidates for autonomous facts. So if somebody is wondering uh, whether water contains, or why water contains hydrogen, right? somebody's wondering why water contains hydrogen, uh, they don't know what water is. They might know what the word water means, right? Yeah, because people nice. knew the meaning of the English word water long before they knew about hydrogen. But they don't know what water is if they're wondering why it contains hydrogen. So, um, so that's the kind of distinction. And, uh, and so the idea is that these definitions might be autonomous facts. And then the question is, can we get everything, everything to ground out in autonomous facts, right? Um, that's the, the aim. And so the existence of God could be uh, an autonomous fact or explained by an autonomous fact if, as uh, philosophers reaching back to Avicenna have held, God's essence or real definition somehow contains or implies existence 
Or maybe on the radical divine simplicity view, God's essence is the same as God's existence. That's how they send his thesis. Um, and so the, the point here is that that's the structure that the view has to have if it's going to explain everything. So this is a, it's not something that's proved. It's a hypothesis that's introduced in order to explain everything. And if you uh, read the, the paper by Dasgupta, uh, Metaphysical Rationalism is the title of uh, the paper where he draws this distinction between autonomous facts and group facts. Uh, Dasgupta says that this is consistent with naturalism, right? But even he says, ultimately you're gonna have to have some entities whose essence includes existence. And he wonders if that might be true of like the quantum fields or fundamental particles or something. Uh, because that's the structure the view has to happen, has to have if it's going to get this kind of ultimate uh, explanation back out. And then in terms of how that, sorry, gets the theistic view out of the concern of like brute um, contingency, what, you know, like with, with God's kind of choices and acts of, uh, and free acts. Right. So the claim is going to be, um, so real definitions are autonomous facts. They don't need explanations. The real definition of God somehow um, explains uh, God's existence. Right. And it's also going to explain um, divine omnipotence and divine omniscience. And so like the knowledge God has, the choice of creation God makes and, and so on. Now, the really tricky part is if we think that uh, God's creative act or creative choice is contingent, um, or if we think the universe is contingent, how do we get there? And that's supposed to be one of the major advantages of the, the theistic view. Um, but it is in fact the, the trickiest bit to get working. And I should note here that a lot of these classical, a lot of the, the kind of more classical than me theists, the uh, Avicenna and Aquinas and, and so on, they need to think that God's creative activity is itself necessary because God's creative activity is identical with God. And so they need to say that the fact that that activity produces this world rather than a different one is somehow contingent. There's some other possible world where God performs the very same act and produces by that very same act a different world or none at all. And I have trouble understanding how that's consistent with God having any kind of control over what world emerges, right? It seems like if that's going to create a world on purpose, God needs to perform a certain act on purpose when God could have performed other acts. Um, okay, so what happens in terms of getting from God's existence and nature to God's act? Well, what's going to have to happen is a, a free choice. Um, and it's going to have to be a free choice in some kind of sense that implies metaphysical contingency. Um, if we're going to have robust contingency, I'm, I'm sometimes tempted by weaker notions of, of contingency. Um, so uh, what I think goes on here is I think any plausible view of how you explain actions by means of motives or reasons is going to imply that you can give a total explanation, a complete explanation uh, of an action, right? You can give a complete explanation of an action without necessitating, that doesn't necessitate the action. And so what we're thinking about in terms of how we explain actions, if you think about jury deliberation in a courtroom, right? The, the prosecutor needs to give an account of the defendant's motives that is going to provide a plausible explanation of why the defendant allegedly committed the crime, right? And the jury needs to think both that that explanation was correct and that that explanation doesn't necessitate the crime, right? Because if the defendant had no choice, then they wouldn't think they were responsible. And so they need to think these kind of motives, right? Motives explain actions without necessitating them. And even compatibilists are generally going to think that motives explain actions without metaphysically necessitating them. Um, right? They might think that kind of the laws of nature 
together with, they're going to think the laws of nature together with our complete previous state is going to imply our, our actions, but they're not going to think that like um, the motive of greed, the, the defendant's motive of greed necessitates the defendant's action of theft or anything like that. Um, and so at the level of these kind of psychological explanations, we have complete explanation without necessitation. And that's exactly what we need in order to get kind of multiple possible outcomes while still having complete explanation of everything. And so that's how the theistic view is, is supposed to work. Um, but, but let me say this, this bit about where the, the contingency comes in is to my mind the, the trickiest, most difficult and problematic bit for theists. And I am still writing about it. I have more stuff in progress. Um, and, the, and the reason is because I'm just not, not totally satisfied with, that, with, with the, this crucial piece of the puzzle. I think it's, it's really difficult to, to get just right. Well, I at least think what you've said about inferring contingency makes sense to me. You know, I'm I'm prepared to to accept that much. I think, but um, I I suppose maybe I didn't phrase um the concern here very well. It's some you know it's something like, well, you know, if you you compare the theistic model to the naturalist model, and the problem okay, you could say a problem for the naturalist model is like a, a lot of these things are, are very brute, right? But isn't the theist model just as brute? Because if you ask, well, why did God set the fine, you know, set the fine-tuning constants to these values, right, rather than those values? Well, because he did that, right? <laughs> it's kind of the, you know, like P because P, and so you, it, it it's brute in that sense, but you know, it, it's kind of contingently brute because it's a free, it's a free choice. And is that is that then a kind of symmetry breaker between the two? Like they're, they're both equally as brute, maybe with respect to all the things, but one says at least like maybe one says it's brute necessity and maybe that's better than contingency. I, I, yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure brute necessity is better than brute contingency, but I'm neither. Am I, but. Yeah. Yeah. Cause, it, cause if you're just, yeah. So anyway, yeah. Necessities are, are tricky and you wonder why things are necessary all the time. Like why couldn't it have been otherwise is it's kind of puzzling, but, uh, but regardless of that, I don't think, I don't think what we have here is, is brute. For instance, I'm not a big fan of the fine tuning argument myself, but if you buy the fine tuning argument, then you're gonna think, why did God set the constants to those values? Because those values are conducive to life and God likes life, right? And so in order, because life is valuable. And so in order to produce things of value, God did it. And so we're gonna have a motive that gives an explanation. Now, it needs to be a non-necessitating explanation um, I really recommend this, this paper by Alex Proust, um, Divine Creative Freedom, on this sort of topic on how we can understand God as having a, a kind of wide variety of options, you know, none of which is necessitated, but all of which are explicable in terms of what God values, uh, and God values what's objectively good. So that's what we need. Um, that's what we need is this kind of uh, motive that necessarily God values what's good. And we can kind of explain the possible choices God could make in terms of competing goods or something like that. So I do, I, I do have a further question. I'm sorry if I'm sort of derailing from the, the questions that I have. Like I, it, it would just be, you know, supposing that classical theism is true and God's kind of perfect and self-sufficient. And I think that this is a sort of almost like a problem of evil that Oppie gives in arguing about gods is, you know, why would God kind of have a reason to create something external to himself or so, you know, like, cause he's kind of, he's not lacking anything or, um, I mean, he, he, he's perfectly kind of satisfied, you know, and maybe the idea of having wants and desires kind of maybe that plausibly entails some kind of lack of it in some sense. So, I mean, I mean, are those reasons for God's create? How, how do you make sense of those reasons for God's creation, kind of given you know classical theism? Yeah, so there's a classic uh, line here, a kind of slogan: uh, "Goodness is diffusive of itself." This goes back to Plato, who says that kind of if the if the God was was good all by himself and wanted to be good all by himself instead of other things being good. Uh, he would be somehow envious, right? He'd be thinking that his goodness was somehow detracted from by there also being other good things. And that's not an attitude worthy of a God. 
the problem then that people like Thomas Aquinas come into is they want to claim that God didn't have to create. And it sounds like this platonic argument leads to the conclusion that God has to create. Otherwise, God would be envious in this objectionable sort of way. Um, but I think we need to, to think of um, God acting for the sake of the goodness of the world God's creating. And so it's not a need or lack on God's part. It's rather this kind of uh, objective goodness that God is acting to bring about. There's uh, an objective goodness in, in God, the act by which God, uh, God produces the world. And so we need to be looking at that sort of thing rather than at something God wants or lacks. Yeah. Uh, so the next question then was to do with, so it, it, this is kind of like a, ch a chip against Oppie's theory as well. So Oppie kind of postulates the initial kind of segment of, of space time, if, if segment is the correct word to use there, because I'm not a physicist, but the, you know, like if you, if you look at space time as a four dimensional monofold, the, the initial part or whatever is necessary according to Oppie. Um, and so you kind of raise some objections from science uh, for Oppie's view. And you say that this is kind of an internal tension as well, because, you know, a mark in favor of naturalism is supposed to be something like, well, naturalism is kind of motivated by our best scientific theories and practices, you know, right. what they what they tell us about the world. So do you want to kind of um, just talk about what this objection is to Oppie's view? Yeah, so so Graham's view, it's, it's a kind of powers theory of modality. And so his view is that, um, you know, the, the possible ways for the world to be are um, ways things kind of could have gone if uh, indeterministic events had gone differently, that there were powers, powers really in existence that kind of could have produced them by another path. And so that's going to imply that there is a, a kind of beginning part of the universe, not necessarily a first event, um, right, but, a, but an initial segment, as you said, of the universe that is necessary before we get the kind of first indeterministic forking. And what this is going to imply is that, for instance, if the universe is finite in age, as our current best theories suggest, then it's metaphysically necessary that it be finite in age. Um, it's going to imply that kind of whatever constants were in effect from the beginning of the universe, if they're not set by some kind of symmetry breaking process or uh, quantum field theory thing, uh, right? If there's constants that are set at the beginning, then those constants are gonna be metaphysically necessary um, and so on. And uh, it seems to me that this is kind of flying in the face of the way I cautiously put it is the most straightforward interpretations of our current best science by allowing for a lot less contingency than science need, uh, seems to allow for. And the, the most straightforward way of thinking about this is in terms of general relativity, where you might think that the, um, so Einstein's field equations are the basic equations of, of general relativity. And there are these kind of global solutions to the equations that give us the total shape of space time that determine, for instance, whether the universe is finite in age or whether it's always been there, whether it's expanding or collapsing, uh, and so on. And it's not only kind of in the math, but part of the practice of physics to think that a lot of these different solutions have physical significance, are ways the universe could be. Um, and so this idea that um, if the universe uh, has a beginning, then it necessarily has a beginning, sort of thing. This is something that is being imposed on the physics for metaphysical reasons in a very unnaturalistic fashion, right? Um, and so we can make similar arguments for kind of, um, you know, what we need the scope of contingency to be um, in order to understand our, uh, our best scientific theories. So I think the there are, there's maybe sort of two um, responses that Oppie gives to this. One of them is going to be something like, um, well, this just isn't the sort of thing that you can kind of read metaphysics off of. Um, and the second one is going to be that because this is kind of in conflict with other parts of science, and, and this is kind of well known, it's not something that's kind of well settled enough 
to really you know be it be a kind of right. important um datum for um our metaphysical theory uh, so do you want to kind of talk about your responses to oppie's kind yeah. of yeah so so there's kind of a there's kind of a couple of different uh a couple of different issues here one is you know what Cram actually says is oh the the science isn't that settled and so we can't uh and so we can't read this often i just if if general relativity isn't settled science, then nothing is. So I don't know. I, I just I just don't see what he's talking about there. And and he's happy to appeal to science for claims about the nature of mind. And and I just I just can't get my head around the idea that that any claim about mind is scientifically settled and general relativity isn't. I so so that so that bit about the about the science being unsettled. It seems like not the direction that the naturalist should go. Now, a, a kind of better direction for the naturalist to go is, to, of course, to say there are controversial uh, interpret there are controversial matters of interpretation here. Uh, to say that the physics is not, uh, as it were, it's not final, right? No scientific theory is ever final, right? So that's why I said if general relativity is not settled, then nothing is. Uh, no scientific theory is ever final, so we're still looking for a, a theory of quantum gravity. Um, so the naturalist might kind of try to place some bets on where it's going to go, um, and and Graham makes some directions in that, some comments in that direction. In that kind of case, I think he needs to do more to point out why he expects uh, why he expects it to go this direction rather than another, a direction that would would rule out contingency. Another direction a naturalist could go, of course, is to raise questions about interpretation. So a, a methodological approach that I have that I think a naturalist could uh, reject or at least kind of moderate is that I, I think that kind of explaining what their theories mean in uh, ordinary language and not just in math is Part of science, part of the, the thing that scientists are expert at, and part of what we should defer to them on. Um, and of course, we need to realize they're not intending to be doing metaphysics when they do that. So we can't like read pop physics uh, books, right? Um, and just read metaphysics off of them in a naive way. But nevertheless, I think when they are doing those explanations, whether in popular books or beginning textbooks. Um, that they're kind of acting within their expertise and we need to give them some deference. And so there are naturalistic philosophers like John Divers, for instance, who don't seem to agree with me on that point, um, who think like, no, you only really need to take the math seriously and the math doesn't say anything about other possibilities. Um, there are just, there's some possibilities and that doesn't rule out, but that doesn't mean, or some. That, that was like the first of the two I was kind of mentioning where I was saying, well, it's just not, until, it's just not committing in that way, maybe, or something like that, what, the, what they actually say. Right. So, yeah, so that, I think, um, so, the, so I think the two directions a naturalist could go, if it, whether, so, okay, so there's three options, as I see it, for the naturalist. One is to accept brute contingency, which I think is the dominant view among naturalistic philosophers, but, but Graham doesn't want to go that direction. Um, you know, worldview comparison is always a trade-off. And so accepting brute contingency is not game over, right? Um, so, so one way they could go is they can accept brute contingency. A second way they can go is to say, uh, look, you're reading way too much metaphysics into these like loose statements made in plain language. And if you go deeper into the science, you don't get this kind of support for a contingency. Um, that you're claiming. Um, now that's a, a case that would need to be made in detail by someone who's going into depth in the science, right? Um, but that's a, a way that could go. Uh, and a third claim, a third direction the naturalists could go, which would also require getting deep into the science, would be there is some reason to expect that this kind of contingency is um, likely to disappear given the direction the science is heading and kind of which possibility for quantum gravity you're betting on, right? And again, you'd need to be really deep into the uh, into the physics in order to make that case. So those, I think, are kind of the uh, the three directions the the naturalist could go um, in response. But the the thing is, if you're saying that that general relativity is unsettled, even though it's not a final theory because there are never final theories in, in science. <clears throat> 
Uh, at that point, Graham's claim that philosophers have to follow settled science becomes empty because there's no longer such a thing as settled science. So just being cognizant of time, um, I've got sort of one more question uh, on the actual kind of content and then a couple of kind of wrap up questions. So maybe, I mean, this one doesn't have to be too in depth, but I, you know, it's kind of a broad topic as well. So visit the last kind of chip in your favor is kind of, you talk about um, a reading epistemology, which again, uh, you know, on the face of it, you and Graham sort of agree about, but then it turns out maybe there are some disagreements later on, but um do you want to talk about how you see a reading epistemology of making sense of religious experience um, and that being a kind of evidential piece in favor of, of theism um, in brief? Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so as you say, Graham and I agree on a broadly reading approach to epistemology. The idea here is that, um, look, Descartes got it wrong. It's a mistake to try to throw out all of your beliefs and start from scratch. If you try to do that, you'll just never dig yourself out of that hole. Uh, I really like this uh, quote from Wittgenstein. If you tried to doubt everything, you would never get as far as doubting anything, right? Um, and, and so we just, we can't take that approach. So what's the alternative to, to that approach? The alternative is that we need to start from where we are. So you start by believing your eyes and ears. You start by trusting what your parents and teachers told you uh, and, and so on. Whatever beliefs you kind of find yourself with when you start doing philosophy or science or whatever. And then you look for reasons to revise them. And you also start with, and so you start with this kind of general attitude of trust in your faculties, right? But of course, all uh, adults, and even children from a very young age know that that trust can't be absolute. That we trust people generally, but we understand that they sometimes lie and we have a sense of the circumstances in which they lie. And we trust our senses generally, but we know that there are sometimes illusions and hallucinations. And we have an idea of what circumstances that happens in. Now the idea is uh, of, of this reading and argument about religious experience is that you start from that kind of approach. You start from that attitude of trust. And uh, from that attitude of trust, you need to kind of trust the full range of human faculties and experiences until you're given a reason not to. And religious experience, experiences that people interpret as experiences of God, uh, is extremely widespread, right? Um, there's a, one of the questions that Graham and I get into, I think not deeply enough in this book, I think there's so much more to be said about this, um, is the, the question of the diversity of religious experience and um, kind of what that means for, for the arguments. We say a little bit about that, but not enough, I think. Um, but the, uh, the idea is that these sorts of experiences are extremely widespread. And so just like all of our other, uh, the, all the other deliverances of our faculties, they're innocent until proven guilty. Um, and so the fact that the theist uh, has this, this kind of trust in religious experience is other things being equal, uh, an advantage in the game of worldview comparison. And again, this is always trade-offs, right? Um, but the, the claim is that that kind of being able to trust religious experience to be able to take it as somewhat reliable or sometimes veridical uh, is kind of an other things being equal advantage for the theist. So just two quick wrap up questions then. Um, one of them is, do you wish you kind of did anything differently in retrospect about, you know, this kind of engagement, how you went about it and how you would have uh, liked to have directed it? Yeah, so I guess I would say um, something that was good for us about the process is that we uh, we cleared up a lot of things along the way and and we learned that we didn't agree about all the things we thought we agreed on and, um, and kind of changed our understanding of, of one another's uh, ob objections and, and arguments. And so if you're, if you're reading the book, you kind of have to follow us through that process. That's, that's the way a debate like this goes. But of course, a, a debate that started from the understanding that we have now might have gone a, a different direction, right? I might have started out, we might have started out from the beginning emphasizing our differences on uh, the concept of worldview. Um, 
we might have there's there's some stuff that I fear is a little bit confusing about the uh, the euthyphro dilemma and the notion of grounding um, in in the book. I thought that Graham was saying the notion of grounding was incoherent uh, or unintelligible, and I went a particular direction based on that understanding. And um, then in his reply, he comes back and says, um, actually, I was just saying this is an extra bit of complexity that I don't need for my worldview. Um, I wasn't saying it's unintelligible. I understand what you're talking about. I just don't believe in it. Um, so uh, so there's kind of a lot of that kind of stuff where uh, I would say I'm, I'm grateful for what I learned through the process. But uh, just like any project and especially any debate, if I knew at the beginning everything I knew at the end, it would have looked different. Um, and so the last question then is just how, how did your views kind of change um, as a result of this interaction? And I suppose particularly of interest here would be um, views of yours that pertain directly to your kind of theistic model and view, if anything, in that sort of change. Yeah, so I guess I'd say Graham, Graham really pressed me to take a side on a lot of things, and I, I didn't let him pin me down on quite everything. This relates to another kind of difference in how we think worldview comparison works, right? He thinks I should be on the record on absolutely everything. Um, but uh, I did, I did kind of, you know, nail down and take a side on some of these issues about for instance, my denial of contrastive facts. I was kind of going back and forth between a, a couple of views there and I had to think a lot more carefully about how that was gonna work. Um, I also had to uh, look a lot more into how I'm seeing the, uh, the grounding of necessary truths and their, and their relation to God here. And so I found Graham really helpful in, uh, in kind of trying to press me to spell out the details and explain why I wanted to go this direction rather than another direction. And in a lot of cases that also included, you know, disagreeing with other theists and, and taking uh, controversial sides on, on this, that, and the other issue in order to develop what I think is the most coherent and plausible version of uh, the classical theistic worldview in response to Graham's questions and objections. So just for people who've been watching the book is, is there a God a debate? Um, there's a PDF version. Um, and, you know, I think it's it's a very accessible book for people who are kind of new to philosophy of religion to sort of get into things. You know, it, cover, it, it, it does cover some things um, in a bit more depth, but I think most of it's pretty accessible for people. Um, and people who are particularly interested in the kind of contemporary philosophy of religion discussion as well, uh, you know, everything's pretty kind of could engage in philosophy of religion that's that's in there. Um, is there anything that you would want to just direct people towards of yours um, if they're kind of interested in exploring more of your work or any kind of books or anything that you've got coming up that might follow, you know, follow on from some of the thinking that happens in the book? Well, yes, I would say uh, you can can look at kind of the, the complete range of my writings on my website at uh, kennypierce.net uh, or I'm on Twitter at Kenneth L. Pierce. Okay, great. Uh, thank you for coming on. Uh, I appreciate, you know, sort of out of the blue responding and giving up some of your time. Um, and thank you everyone for listening. Um, and I wanted to say thanks to my patrons who support my channel. If you've enjoyed this or the other things that I do, then um, you can become a patron for three pounds a month. And I have some exclusive content coming out um, this week, actually. I'm doing a review of Stephen Hicks explaining postmodernism, the first chapter of that book, which is a uh, very historically um, and philosophically accurate to the uh, saying that sort of tongue in cheek. So, so people who are interested in that um, can have early access if they if they become patrons at some point this week. Um, other than that, thank you for watching. Uh, leave a comment to let me know what you thought, and I'll put the links to Kenny's channel in the description just after this as well, so you can go and check out his stuff. Uh, bye, everyone.